further, I just want to make a few housekeeping remarks. First, a reminder that our August meeting will be conducted via Zoom at 7 p.m. August 18. Uh, Robin Trinkle Russell will lead our discussion of Rome, a history in seven sackings. <laughs> and as Joe just said, tonight's meeting is being recorded for anyone who could not join us. Uh, third, several of you submitted questions for Kent prior to the meeting. He will address some of these questions during his remarks and we'll have a Q&A session for any other questions that you wish to ask about the Cork O'Connor mystery series, as well as his novels, Ordinary Grace and This Tender Land. Uh, finally, during Kent's remarks, Joe will, are you, have you already muted everybody? I'm about to. Okay, he's gonna mute everybody um, now as I introduce Kent and then as Kent speaks. And then after that, we'll have the Q&A session and you'll all be able to, uh, to ask questions if you wish. Okay, so muting all. And then I'm gonna go to Mark and unmute Mark. Whoop. And I'm gonna find Kent and unmute Kent. And let's highlight Mark. Um, okay, oh, you're on. Oh, oh. You should be ready to go. Okay, now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, William Kent Kruger. Kent was born in Wyoming and lived in eight different cities and six different states before he finished high school. He says the only real constant in his life was the dream of becoming a writer. He entered Stanford University in 1969, but as he says, was kicked out after participating in a takeover of the president's office during the Vietnam War protests. Over the next few years, he logged timber, worked construction, tried his hand at freelance journalism. And in 1980, he and his wife, Diane, moved to St. Paul, Minnesota, so she could attend law school. He got a job researching child development at the University of Minnesota and began writing in earnest. As some of you know, he did most of his writing early in the morning in booth number four at the St. Clair Broiler on the corner of Snelling and St. Clair Avenues before going off to his day job. Kent's work, including mo almost 20 Cork O'Connor books, has received a number of awards, including the Minnesota Book Award, the Loft McKnight Fiction Award, and the Friends of American Writers Prize. His last nine books were New York Times bestsellers and his standalone novel, Ordinary Grace, received the Edgar Award from the Mystery Writers of America for the best novel published in 2013. The companion novel, This Tender Land, was published last September. And now it's a real pleasure to turn the program over to Kent. Can you all see me or can you all hear me? You can't tell me because you're all muted. We can. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I wish to God I could be there in person. I wish we were all there in person on the beautiful Madeline Island. Um, and I'm hoping someday when we, when we understand what the new normal is gonna be after all of this uh, coronavirus stuff is hopefully behind us, you'll invite me back. Um, uh, just a quick question, Mark. How long have you been together as a book group? Um, I'm a fairly recent member, just a few years ago. So, uh, Nancy, do you know? Oh, Nancy's new. I don't know. I, it's been a, quite a long time, though. I think. Okay. You've been together quite a while. That's, that's, yeah. that's terrific. That's terrific. Uh, so what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey as a writer and what led me uh, ultimately to compose Iron Lake. And, um, and, but I have to be honest with you, for the most part, I'm hoping that we can exchange, uh, have a little dialogue going here. Anything that you would like to ask me that I haven't answered already, I hope you toss out there because um, I love questions. But let me begin by talking about... Uh, 
how I became a writer in the first place. And I guess I have to say, uh, in all honesty, I blame my parents. <laughs> It'd be a Freudian analyst dream. I blame everything on my parents. Um, and I say that because when I was a child, I hope like a lot of you, I had parents who read to me. When I was a kid, I never went down for a nap. I never went to bed at night without a story being read to me. So I grew up thinking of the world in terms of stories. And for whatever reason, I always wanted to be one of the storytellers. First story I remember writing was a short story in the third grade. It was called The Walking Dictionary. Um, I have to tell you this, my father was a high school English teacher. I don't know if there are any English teachers uh, um, in the group tonight, but, um, but my father, the high school English teacher, was always storming around the house, ranting something like, nobody uses dictionaries enough. Nobody uses dictionaries enough. So in the third grade, I wrote a short story called The Walking Dictionary, which was in fact about a dictionary that didn't think it was being used enough. It magically sprouted legs so that it could toddle off into the world and go to the people that needed it. My third grade teacher went gaga over that story. My folks would and odd. Um, I, have to, I have to be honest, in the third grade, I, <laughs> I knew I was destined to be a writer. So I have always written. Um, but, uh, but for a very long time, I didn't produce anything that I was particularly proud of. Um, and I got to kind of blame my, my father for that one. Um, when I was 18 years old, he insisted that I read Ernest Hemingway. And I fell madly in love with Hemingway. Uh, and so for the next uh, at least two decades, I tried to write the great American novel as Ernest Hemingway might have written it, stupid on so many levels. But uh, about the time I turned 40 and went through my, the midlife crisis everybody goes through. I decided the hell with trying to write the great American novel. I want to write something somebody might actually want to read. So I looked around me to see what everybody reads. You know what everybody reads? Everybody reads mystery. Um, it's a genre whose appeal cuts across socioeconomic levels. So I thought, okay, I'm going to write a mystery. Now here's a confession coming from a mystery writer. Before I began to write them, I didn't read mysteries. My, my father had convinced me they were the poor stepchildren of literature. So I had a lot of catching up to do. Um, and because I really had no idea, you know, I didn't even read The Hardy Boys or, or Nancy Drew growing up. So I really had no idea how to go about writing a mystery. Um, we have this terrific resource here in the Twin Cities, a place called The Loft. It's the largest independent center devoted to the written word in the United States. So I took a class at the loft called Mystery Writing 101. Um, it worked. I wrote the first chapter for Iron Lake in the class I took there. Um, what I decided that I wanted to do when I turned to writing mysteries was something that a guy named Tony Hillerman was doing. I don't know if you know the work of Tony Hillerman, um, but he was an icon in the mystery genre. He wrote a series of books set in the Four Corners area of the Southwest um, that involved significantly the culture of the Diné, the Navajo. When I decided I was going to be a mystery writer, I happened to stumble across Tony Hillerman's books early on. And what I found here was a guy who just wrote uh, with a really profound sense of place. He wrote these really terrifically interesting characters and um, and he was able to weave this fascinating Navajo cultural information into the stories he created. And I looked around me and I, I thought, well, you know, we have the Ojibwe here. And as far as I know, nobody's using the Ojibwe culture to create stories of this kind. So I thought, that's what I'm going to do. What did I know about the Ojibwe at that point? About what most people know about the Ojibwe. Most white people know about the Ojibwe, which really was nothing. But I was a cultural anthropology uh, major in college. And so the idea of learning about this culture, not my own, was, a, was an exciting prospect for me. So I began in a very academic way. I began um, by reading. I read everything I could get my hands on. Uh, the early ethnographies, William Warren and Francis Densmore. Um, I read, uh, I read the works of uh, Basil Johnson, uh, who writes about Ojibwe ritual, and Gerald Visnor, who writes about Ojibwe myth beautifully. Uh, I re read uh, Louise Erdrich and, um, and um, 
no, uh, oh, every, you know, everything I could get my hands on about the Ojibwe culture. Jim Northrup was the guy I was trying to think of. Writes, be wrote beautiful stories um, about the Fond du Lac Reservation. And when I thought I had a pretty good grasp of the Ojibwe culture, uh, I sat down and began to write the manuscript for the novel that would become Iron Lake. Uh, now that across the course of my research for that novel, I began to meet and form relationships with members of the Ojibwe community, um, relationships that have become important friendships to me across these years. And uh, when the manuscript uh, or Iron Lake was finished, I asked a couple of my Ojibwe friends to read it. Um, basically what they said was, uh, you know, here an Ojibwe really wouldn't do this, or here an Ojibwe really wouldn't do that. But generally speaking, they felt that I had captured the spirit uh, of the Ojibwe uh, people quite well. Um, they were very complimentary about it, which pleased me greatly. When I set out to create a character at the heart of the story, um, I, this, is, this is what I wanted to do with that character. When you're a writer of fiction, what you're looking for is conflict because it's conflict that drives great stories. What is it that drives Romeo and Juliet? It's that conflict between the Montagues and the Capulets, those two powerful families, this conflict in which our, our star-crossed lovers find themselves caught. Um, Moby Dick, Ahab and that white whale, conflict, conflict, conflict. When I looked up at the North Country of Minnesota where I decided to set my work, that's all I saw there was conflict. Conflict in, uh, this, in, the, in the kind of landscape that it is, that rugged North Woods. Uh, conflict in the weather, of course, um, and conflict in the, in the nature of the people, Ojibwe and white, uh, trying to live there um, amicably and, you know, not always doing a very good job of it. When I thought deeply about the whole issue of conflict, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if I created a character who, in who he was, would mirror the conflict of those two cultures, white and Ojibwe. So I knew that uh, the character of Cork O'Connor was going to be part Ojibwe, part Anishinaabe. Then I had to figure out what, what his yeah, European ancestry would be. And you know, if you know the North Country of Minnesota, you know uh, the Iron Range, it could be anything. I could have made him Ojibwe German, Ojibwe Swede, Ojibwe Finn, Ojibwe Italian, Ojibwe Russian, Ojibwe Welsh. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, I, I like the idea of making him Ojibwe Irish. Now, my very earliest thinking, even before I knew what kind of a story I was ever going to write, I had in mind a character I might want to write about. And all I knew about him in those very early imaginings was this. He was going to be the kind of character who, he was going to be the kind of character who was so resilient that no matter how far life pushed him down, he would always bob back to the surface. And his name was gonna be Cork. I told that to an audience not too long ago. And one of the guys in the audience said, why didn't you just call him Bob? Um, so anyway, I called him Cork. And when I decided that my main character was gonna be a man of Ojibwe and Irish heritage, Cork became very naturally Corcoran O'Connor. I made him a family man because I'm a family man and I always believe you should write about what you know. I gave him a wife who was a lawyer. My wife is an attorney. Uh, I gave him uh, three children. Uh, I have two. But in so many ways, uh, Cork O'Connor is very similar to the, to the guy I am. Um, that is essentially the background uh, that I brought to the writing of Iron Lake. Um, maybe one more word about why I chose the North Country. As Mark pointed out, I'm not native to Minnesota. I didn't move here until I was about 30 years old so my wife could go to the U of M Law School. Um, but as soon as we moved here, we began doing what everybody in, in the Twin Cities does in the summer. We began vacationing up north in the beautiful north country of Minnesota. We started spending a portion of every summer at a YMCA camp north of Ely called Camp de Nord. Uh, it, and Camp de Nord is literally um, across the road from the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. And when I discovered that remarkable 
at Remarkable Territory. I knew that when I got serious about my writing, whatever it was going to be would be set in, uh, in the beautiful North Country of Minnesota. So that's pretty much the whole background uh, that I brought to the creation of um, Iron Lake. It took me four years to write the novel, um, which probably seems like a long time to all of you, but when I look back on it, boy, did that seem to just scream by. Um, part of it because I was working full time in addition to trying to write, I was raising my children, all of that. So I was a pretty busy guy. Uh, but I was also learning how to write a mystery, which I'd never attempted before. And I got to tell you, honestly, those four years taught me so much about, um, about what writing is, laid the whole foundation um, for the way I approach my writing even today. So I guess those are all of my introductory remarks, Mark. If I haven't addressed any of those questions that readers sent in early, I'd be happy to answer some of those now. <laughs> you haven't unmuted yet, Mark. There we go. Okay. okay. <laughs> Here I am. Um, well, thank you, Kent, uh, for those remarks. Um, here's a fun question from uh, Nancy and Bill Jones. What kind of feedback have you received from readers in other places where they don't chop a hole in the ice in order to jump in the lake? <laughs> Yeah, well, all I got to say is they, those folks don't know what they're missing. <laughs> um, yeah, the feedback that I've had from people who have never been to Minnesota has been nothing but positive. Generally speaking, um, folks are, I'm only seeing Mark. Is anybody seeing me? So yeah. we, <clears throat> we can see you. Folks might want to go to the gallery view now by going to the upper right-hand corner and clicking on the multiple squares. Oh, so there we, we go. see each other. Okay. There we go. Yeah, I was seeing you, Kent. And I, uh, okay. Yeah, I'm <laughs> well, it's nice to see everybody again. <laughs> um, um, I have a few more questions. I, so, so, you know, the feedback I've had from people who've never been to Minnesota is, boy, they want to come here. You know, despite the fact that there are all kinds of murders that take place <laughs> in Aurora, Minnesota, Tamarack County, um, I have painted the picture of a landscape that I have to admit is is really seductive. And, and I do that because I love Minnesota. I love the winters. Um, you know, the mosquitoes and the black flies are sometimes <laughs> a little difficult to put up with. But generally speaking, I think it is, it's, um, it's God's country. It really is. Um, and the feedback I've had is wonderful. And that's great. I like that. I like hearing from folks um, far and wide who would love to visit Minnesota someday because of the work that I've done. But you know what I love hearing better? I love hearing from people who grew up on the Iron Range, people who grew up in northern Minnesota, who write to me and say, you know, you nailed it. I know this town. This is where I grew up. I know these people. I grew up with these people. Um, I love hearing from the Ojibwe community when someone in the Ojibwe community writes to me and says, you know, you have talked about my family, you have talked about my friends, you have talked about my community. Um, that's what really pleases me. Here's a question. Has anyone ever seen a Wendigo? <laughs> my guess is yes. Um, <laughs> they, they, they may have been two sheets to the winds. No, you know, the Wendigo is, it's such a wonderful myth, and it's really a ubiquitous myth among Native people. Uh, you find uh, stories of the Wendigo um, in, uh, in the Native cultures of both the far eastern United States, but you find them all the way down into the southwest as well. So it is a myth that has traveled through all of the Native people. And it's a beautiful myth because it's a myth about... Um, um, the dark side of human nature, the, the, our greed, our insatiable greed, um, uh, our center on self as opposed to others. Um, there's so many wonderful symbolism, such wonderful symbolism in the story of the Wendigo. Um, so my guess is if you haven't seen the, the actual creature of the Wendigo um, lurking in the, in the great North Woods somewhere in the shadows there on Madeline Island, 
you may have seen the seen the Wendigo um, in someone walking on the street who is so self-centered um, and so avaricious that the world is all about them. Okay. Um, here's a question about ordinary grace. Uh, when can we expect to see ordinary grace adapted to film? Um, has there been interest in that or any of your other stories? Yeah. I have a question for everybody there. How come I'm the only one drinking wine? <laughs> Are, yeah, good. <laughs> it's what you're supposed to do with book clubs. Uh, yeah, you know, I signed, uh, there, there's there been interest for the Cork O'Connor uh, series uh, as a television series or movies for 20 years, ever since Iron Lake came out. I've been dealing with Hollywood. Nothing's happened so far. And I got to tell you, Hollywood is the screwiest place you're ever going <laughs> to <laughs> after those people come from another planet. Um, but I signed an option for Ordinary Grace last March with some people I really like, really down to earth people. And I have great hopes that in fact, Ordinary Grace this time uh, will actually um, be translated, um, I, I hope quite well uh, to a screen version. But if that actually happens, it's going to be down the road a piece because everything in Hollywood moves at two speeds, slow and glacial. Oh. Um, yeah. Uh, negotiations for um, This Tenderland, my most recent novel, just broke down last week. Um, but we're waiting to hear back from the other side. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, I've had nibbles out in uh, on Broadway for a Broadway musical of this tender land. <laughs> so wow. I've been dealing with Hollywood for a very long time. I never get really excited uh, anymore about prospects that come my way because God only knows if they're ever gonna actually come, come to fruition, if anything's ever really gonna happen with them. And here's the truth, eight out of 10 novels that are optioned for the big screen never get made. That's <laughs> and of those that are made, my friends, my colleagues in the in the in the writing business, whose work has been translated to the big screen, I can I can tell you on one hand the number of people who've been pleased with the adaptations. Mostly, everyone is disappointed. Mm. As are some of us, I think, when after we've read a book and then seen the movie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a question. I know Ken Ken Meyer. You sent in a couple questions just. Um, this afternoon, uh, would you like to ask those? You need to unmute yourself. There, am I uh, speaking? Yes. <laughs> well, one of them was that question about ordinary grace. Um, just because I was so thrilled with that story and I thought it would make a great visual, uh, I thought it would make a great film. Um, but I was also curious, I think one of the other questions, can, oh, and, and by the way, welcome from Camp de Nord. I think I missed it, but you were at our house in St. Paul, I think a couple of years ago, speaking to the de Nord Book Club. Yeah, I did. I visited them. We missed you. We talked a lot about you while you were gone. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. is true. We did. <laughs> But yeah, you you did speak for the Denard. You did come and join the Denard book group meeting. I do all I can for Denard because it's such a wonderful program. Isn't it great? Yeah, yeah. We were there. That was the one summer week we had planned every year for the 18 years our kids were at home. We had the week up at Denard every summer. It was just fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I guess one of the other questions that I had sent in to Mark was just, I'd be curious to hear what you think about um, you know, current events, a bit about current events, especially with all of the uh, news about the uh, Washington team renaming and, and those sorts of things, you know, what's going on with uh, the, the uh, Native community around the country. It's an interesting time. Yeah, I think we need to be um, really aware of how we have trespassed on the Native cultures um, all that we've taken from the native cultures. Um, and I think what we're seeing now is, um, is, is, <laughs> is a request or a demand, don't do that anymore. And, uh, and what we've already given up, you know, we would like to take back. How many of you have been, have been following the, uh, the decision uh, in, uh, by the Supreme Court in the Oklahoma case? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Half of Oklahoma really belongs, still belongs to uh, the native people. My cousins live uh, live on land that's probably now <laughs> not and never really was theirs. <laughs> so it's um, it is a unique time, and I think we simply need to be very um, sensitive to uh, the requests to uh, please don't use us in this way, don't use our culture in this way. Um, there are so many things about the sacred about who we are, how we think of ourselves, uh, how we're presented. Um, and you, you know, shouldn't monkey with that. Um, and, and we've been too cavalier, so cavalier in the past on these issues. So I think it's time to change the Redskins to something else. You know, the Redskins <laughs> is, is not a very, um, uh, you know, complimentary epithet. Uh, and so it's time to change. Okay. I agree. Um, oh, and I'll, I'll just give you a quick follow-up, uh, Ken. I was curious what you've replaced the uh, the uh, St. Clair broiler with. You can't go there anymore. Yeah. You know, the truth is the broiler and I parted ways about eight years ago. Um, the guy who'd owned it for 40 years, a wonderful guy named Jimmy Theros, mm -hmm. sold the broiler. And the new people, nice people, actually it was Jimmy's cousin, came in. And the first thing they did was remodel. And in my opinion, they just carved the heart right out of that wonderful funky cafe where I'd written for a quarter of a century. But about that same time, we moved from that area to the Como Park area of St. Paul. And getting to the broiler became a little problematic anyway. So I, I shifted to coffee shops up in, in my new neighborhood. And that's where I do my writing now. But, you know, I got to tell you this. So Mark indicated that when I wrote at the broiler, I always wrote, wrote in booth number four. They always saved the booth for me. If anybody sat down there, I, I always, usually arrived at six o'clock in the morning. But if somebody got there ahead of me and sat in booth number four, they would chew them out because I was going to be there. They saved it for me. And when the remodeling was being done, I got a call from the contractor, from the, actually the manager of the place at that point. He said, uh, Mr. Kruger, we are about to toss out booth number four. Do you want it? My wife was standing with me as I took the phone call and she said, no, we don't. So uh, booth number four went out. But, you know, I, I will always have a, a, a wonderful place in my heart for the St. Clair broiler. Yeah, as do many of us St. Paulites. Yeah. Do you know, I got to tell you this. I do events all over the country and it's not uncommon for somebody, you know, in Boston or Fort Myers or uh, Tucson to come up to me and say, I know the broiler. Very often they're Mac students and, oh. you know, they studied at the broiler. Uh, well, th that takes care of the questions that were submitted ahead of time now. Um, does anybody else have a uh, additional question? Um, Marsha? Right. Um, I was wondering, uh, when you wrote Long Lake, had you envisioned a series for Cork O'Connor or just the one novel or one story? Sure. That, and that's a really good question, Marcia. Um, every author I know who writes a series didn't think they were going to write a series when they wrote that first book. All of us just wanted to write a story that would be good enough somebody actually wanted to publish it. But you know, as I was writing uh, Iron Lake about three quarters of the way through, um, I realized, you know, I'm creating relationships in this book that are so complex. I'm not going to be able to tie them all up at the end of Iron Lake. And I thought, okay, where do I want all of these people to be eventually? And when I visualized that place, I thought, you know, it's going to take me about three novels to get there. And in fact, it did. If you look at the three novels, and the first three novels in the Cork O'Connor series, Iron Lake, Boundary Waters, and Purgatory Ridge, they form um, an arc, a story arc, that take, takes Cork from the, the very near dissolution of his marriage toward ultimately reconciliation and uh, the coming back together again of Cork and Joe and the family. Um, and that's really where I realized, okay, I guess I have a whole series ahead of me. <laughs> Great, thanks. You're welcome. Um, Burke? I had my, I think my earliest reading was somewhat along the lines of, you know, a young 
male who was going to become a hero and became a series of books. I was, I, I did all my reading on those kinds of books like you developed. You mentioned a few, but the ones that I remember were things like the X-Bar X-Boys on the ranch, <laughs> the X-Bar X-Boys on the cattle drive, et cetera. You know, they must have had sure. in the series and I read them all. I remember the Dave Dawson in the RAF <laughs> and Dave Dawson flying over France and et cetera. And I just read every single one of those series and it became a reader for me. I mean, you know, that's how I became a reader. Dad, you, you've made such a good point. Um, I think it's important that there are writers out there who direct their work toward a younger audience. Because once kids get hooked on the idea um, that it's not just a whole bunch of words and a lot of pages, it's a story. And it's a great story. They understand the power of words and the power of story. And, I, and I'm, I'm praying to God that they be readers all their life. Think about a whole generation turned on by he, uh, Harry Potter. You know, I'm hoping that continues. And I'm so, you know, I had the same experience. I had different series, but exactly the same experience of, of discovering these stories that hooked me as a kid. Adventure stories, because I was a guy, for the mm -hmm. most part. Yeah. Bravo. <laughs> Let me tell you one more. <laughs> Let me tell you one more thing. I just want to go back. We don't, I've never met you before. Uh, you know, this is a wonderful evening for us. And, but your story about Stanford and your issues at Stanford in the late 60s, I had, I had the very, we could have met right there. <laughs> I was, I was sponsoring a bunch of research studies at the Stanford Electronics Laboratory during the times of discontent and uh, got forced out of that area during the riots, uh, during the, you know, the protest, the protest. The protest well, they pretty know. much approached riots at a couple of points. <laughs> it did, it did, unfortunately. And, uh, but it was quite significant. So I, I might have crossed paths with you. I think I remember you. <laughs> he was yeah. the one with no hair. I, <laughs> Even then, huh? <laughs> I had no hair then, too, also. Um, I just realized that I was remiss in, uh, in passing along a question that, that Lynn sent in. Uh, Lynn, do you want to uh, ask that question? Yeah. About I can. Some of it was already answered. When your wife is a lawyer, you can't have her die in your first episode, I don't think. <laughs> but um, the question that I had was, um, one of the characters who I really liked was his girlfriend, who you had to make disappear in a rather unpleasant way. And it made me feel sad. I wondered whether that was because by then you'd already decided you needed the continuity or um, what made you do that, aside from the fact that bumping off a woman who is the wife of your protagonist, who is a lawyer, would probably cause problems at home, I suspect. <laughs> oh, you are a very perceptive woman. <laughs> here's, here's the story of the killing of Molly. Um, so I didn't plan out this novel. I was discovering it as I was going along. But one of the things I understood from the reading that I had uh, done so far was that if the protagonist has someone, uh, a love interest, you are required to put that love interest in jeopardy so that the hero can save her. That's what heroes do. And so I was writing at the broiler and I had created everything up to the point where Molly was gonna be in danger uh, in the sauna. Sauna. Um, and, uh, and I couldn't go forward. And I tried and I tried and I simply couldn't go forward. And then the thought came to me, is it because Quark isn't going to save her? Is that what you're fighting against? So I went to the broiler one morning and I decided I'm going to write this scene and however it turns out is the way it's supposed to be. Now, in the course of writing the scene in which Molly dies on the ice, 
um, the, uh, the woman who always served me coffee in the morning came up to me and she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, Kent, are you all right? Uh, because there were tears <laughs> coming down because it hurt me to kill Molly. But it was the right thing to do. And it was the right thing to do for a couple of reasons. First of all, just in terms of the story arc, it's what drives Cork to the confront that important confrontation on the ice at the end of the book. It's that motivation. Um, but it did, did something in it, and it did, it did two things for me beyond that. The first was this. It elevated the story beyond a beach read. People who have read Iron Lake typically tell me, I love the book, and why did you have to kill Molly? <laughs> and years later, when they've forgotten everything else about the story, they remember that Molly died because they cared about Molly. Someone who they had invested their heart in died. And it wasn't just an entertaining beach read anymore. It became something more important. But in the long run, when I think about my series, this is what I realized Killing Molly did. When you're trying to create suspense in a mystery novel, you don't really get very far when you put your protagonist in, in danger because every astute reader knows that you're going to have to pull your protagonist's ass out of the fire at some point because that, that male or female, that hero, hero or heroine, has to be in the next book. So they're no, they, they, they start out knowing, okay, he's going to be okay. But people who read Iron Lake know that when I put anybody else in danger, they might not make it to the end of the book. And that's where the true suspense comes into play. So I'd sacrifice Molly again in a heartbeat. Oh, no. um, I had a follow-up question to that in a way, because um, I thought it was interesting that the, that the book started out with uh, Cork and uh, Joe uh, estranged from each other uh, and how did you decide to do that yeah I mean I know you as we go through the book you give us bits and pieces of of their problems but uh, I thought it was an interesting way to you know to start out well one of the things that you try to do when you are um, when you're looking at engaging the reader as early as you can is uh, you bring the reader into the middle of, of something and then the reader has to spend some time trying to figure out what's going on so i brought reader readers into the middle of the dissolution of the relationship things have already gone south um and i wanted the reader to see cork at his lowest point this is a guy who's lost everything he's lost his job he's lost his self-respect He's on the verge of losing his family. And so the question is, how can, you, how can you come back from that? And that's essentially the story of Iron Lake, how Cork comes back from that. And then the novels that follow as well. Um, so I just wanted, you know, for me, that's how I always saw, I, I, I always saw the story arc. It was going to start low and it was going to end essentially on a much higher note, though Molly died. Um, but by the time Cork says goodbye to Molly at the end of the story, he's in a very different place um, in his understanding of who he is and what he wants out of life. Okay, thank you. Um, does anybody else have a question? Sarah, you have to unmute yourself. We're unmuted. Oh, Carol? Yeah, Keith's got a question. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an author, but it seems to me that writing in a coffee shop would be distracting. <laughs> why that versus home where it's quiet? Okay, why the coffee shop? That's a good question. Why not home? Um, I have to tell you, honestly, I know lots of writers who write in coffee shops. I don't know if they write there for the same reason I do, but here's my reason. Um, so when my wife entered law school and I became uh, the sole support of the family, I, I still wanted to be a writer. And um, 
and I, t I told you earlier on that Hemingway was a huge, I was a huge fan of Hemingway. And one of the things that I knew about Hemingway's process was he loved nothing better than to rise at first light and spend the first two hours of every day writing. He thought it was the most creative time of the day. So we were living two blocks from the broiler, which opened its doors at six o'clock every morning. So I pitched this idea to Diane, my wife. I said, honey, if you're willing to get the kids up and, and dressed and fed and off to school first thing so that I can go right, I swear to you, when I come home from my job at the end of the day, I will be the best husband, the best father you can possibly imagine. <laughs> she bought it. So there I was at the broiler at six o'clock every morning to do my writing. So my process developed in a coffee shop. And all of that noise that you think of as distracting became simply for me white noise. So I learned how to sink myself deeply into wherever it was I, I needed to go in my imagination. And all of that noise had nothing to do with me. You know, a waitress drops a tray of dishes, big deal. I don't have to worry about it. It's not my problem. Um, and in fact, it, it, ha it reached the point where I simply couldn't write creatively at home. It was too quiet. I actually have had this experience. Um, I tried to write at home uh, on, a, on a winter day one time. I had the house to myself. And I remember the day, the, um, the, the you know, snow outside, the sun was out, the snow was all sparkly. It's very quiet. It's exactly the kind of environment you would think of as being conducive to creative work. And what am I doing? I'm sitting there going, hmm. Shouldn't the furnace have come on by now? You know, the, the, the silence was distracting to me. You know, I walk by the, the sink and I'm thinking, ah, I should get to those dishes. <laughs> the phone rings, I got to answer it. Somebody knocks at the door. But I'm at the coffee shop. Nothing there has anything to do with me. It's my office. It's where I do my work. And all of that noise has no effect on me. Um, Sarah, did you have a question? Um, I just wanted to say that I really appreciated, I, I liked your writing a lot. This is, I'm not a mystery novel reader, but I really enjoyed your book very much. Um, and the comment that, that you made or that Wally Shano made about Cork, excuse me, by just the opposite, that Cork made about Wally Shano was that the problem with him Wally, is that you stopped looking for the truth. And that struck me as the counterpart to Windigo in a way. I mean, that's really, that's where we all fall down, is when we come up against the truth and we might back away from it and make other choices. Oh, so, that's, that's, um, what a lovely observation. Thank you, Sarah. Well, that Windigo was really, I, I thought that was a driving force of the book. Every page, the Windigo is there. And I was just trying to figure out how it affects people and, and whether, it, whether it called, did it, I'm sorry, I just finished the book and my head is full of all the characters. But did the Windigo ever call Cork or did he just sense it? Because... He believes he, believes he <laughs> hears the Windigo call us and, and it's... You know, white for white folks, it's Windigo. If you're Ojibwe, it's Windigo. Um, Windigo. Um, Windigo. Yeah, Cork believes he has heard the Windigo call his name. But if the Windigo is after you, then you're evil <clears throat> too. I mean, that not that a sign that you have walked, you've, you've gone too far with your greed? Um, I'm not sure that that's necessarily true. Uh, probably, nor is it necessarily true that Cork really heard the Wendigo call his name. <laughs> I think maybe he was just sensing the fear, his his fear of the Wendigo. I don't or know. Of, he's, or of everything that's going on. That, that could very well have been. He seemed like the antithesis of it. Um, and then the other wonderful comment that was made was at Russell, um, Blackwater's demise out in the middle of the lake when he went through the ice in his snowmobile. Um, the comment that the that that uh, Cork made when he looked out just over the the quiet lake hole, you know, the, the open lake water, and knew that Russell was was down there somewhere. He was in the process of sinking and drowning. And he said, the lake looked so calm, so peaceful. 
um, as if swallowing a man was nothing. That really got me. That <laughs> it just seemed so powerful that, you know, just for that moment that he was perceiving that, um, you know, the power of the lake and, and how fast a person can disappear. Do you know, one of the things that um, has always impressed me about Minnesota is that um, it can kill you in, in lots of different ways. And that's certainly one of them. Uh, yeah. But you know, you, you hear all of the time, people lost in storms and they freeze to death. Uh, people out on Lake Superior falling over and that, that water all, you know, freeze your bones in what, 13 minutes, you're dead. I don't know what it is now. Um, so, so Minnesota is this place with uh, like two faces. It is incredibly beautiful and it can be incredibly deadly. And I just love that about it. Any more questions? Um, Bruce, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Mr. Cooper, thanks for making this occur. I, I have a kind of a mechanical question for you. I, I read an article once about mystery authors using spreadsheets to track when people came in and out. And how do you sort of button all that up? It's got to be more than just post-it notes. Yeah, I don't use a spreadsheet or post-it notes. I just keep it all up here. Now I do that because I've written uh, 20 novels. But in the early days, I outlined to keep it all straight. Um, I would outline actually chapter by chapter. So I knew what every character was involved in, how what happened in one chapter would lead to what happened in the next one, or even into chapters beyond that to help keep everything straight. Because mysteries are very complex, uh, you know, vehicles. Um, but I've been at it so long that when I think I, in these days, you know, when I wrote Iron Lake, I didn't know where I was going with it. I was discovering the story as I went along. Um, but then I began to <laughs> began to outline because it was easier. But these days, um, I keep when I think the story through, and I do for several weeks or even several months before I put my fingers to the keyboard. Um, I I know how to keep the story straight. I know who's important. I know the keep the key turning points uh, of the story, all of that. So I don't need a spreadsheet. And generally speaking, I don't need post-it notes. Uh, but that's, you're, we're talking now uh, across 25 years of ha having done this. This is how I operate. But I still know lots of writers who use spreadsheets. Their, their walls are covered with post-it notes and other kinds of things to help them track what's going on and who's related to who and who killed whom and all of that. So, yep, there's still guys out there who do it. And who knows? They probably write better books than I do. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Uh, Pat? How do you unmute? I just did. Okay. Um, I'm curious about uh, how Cork has developed over the span of all the the work that you've done and whether you are surprised or he surprised you um, as he's developed over that time. So if you can just talk a little bit about how he's changed and sure. how, how much of that you had in mind at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, like I, <laughs> not like I planned 17 novels at the beginning of this, right? <laughs> but the one, Pat, the one thing I did plan was is that across the course of the series, once I realized there were going to be more than one book, was the decision to have Cork age across time and the characters around him age in more or less natural time. So there are 17 books currently published in the series and they span 15 years in the lives of Cork and the other characters involved. Um, so uh, Stevie and Annie and Jenny have all grown up across the course of the series. Um, they've created their own lives, although the, they still all the O'Connors interweave, their lives interweave. Rose has gone on to a, a life of her own with, uh, with a marriage and a child of her own. Um, and, and Cork has suffered greatly <laughs> across the course of 17 novels. I don't want to give away too much, but he, he has suffered significant loss. Um, he has grieved greatly. Um, and he's grown a good deal in his understanding. And one of the things that Cork 
early on, I believed that the genre required that um, I have a lot of killings um, and that some brutality had to occur. I'm in a whole different place in my life and Cork is in a whole different place. <laughs> so when I write mysteries these days, I, I hold the number of deaths to a, a minimum. Um, I try not to be particularly graphic when I need to describe somebody's death. Um, and I try to focus a whole lot more on psychologically, um, socially, culturally, what's going on in the stories. Uh, so, so, yeah, go oh, on. So, so, Pat, have you read a number of the stories? Oh, I've read all but the last four, and I literally saved them. <laughs> <laughs> and I like to read them on Madeline Island because your description of the Northwoods is magnificent. Well, it reminds me so much of the scenery of Madeline Island. Thank you. For those of you who uh, uh, love the Apostle Islands, I did feature the Apostle Islands in uh, Wendigo Island. Right. Uh, right. And, yeah. He's read all of them. <laughs> yes. Thank I read them first and pass them on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, she says, is this good? And I said, oh, it's better than the last one. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say that um, for those, for those of you who haven't read um, any of the others beyond Iron Lake, uh, I would encourage you to do so. Oh, I do have another quick question. What was the name of the lake that the original showdown was over the uh, fishing and and netting rights? Which in, lake? In reality, lake? yeah. Do you know? I actually based that scene on. Um, confrontations that had taken place in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, Turtle Lake? Although, yeah, although they, they were going on in Minnesota as well, but the ones where uh, violence occurred or was threatened really were in Wisconsin. And so um, that it was based on that. And that was more, that was, do you know, I wrote this book over 20 years ago and I don't really recall. <laughs> Well, Turtle Lake was on fire right around 1995, 1994, okay. and um, and I was there uh, sort of indirectly. I was there for for a Friday night showdown, and uh -huh. um, and so I've always had Turtle Lake in my mind as I read the book. That's just fine. <laughs> okay. I think ours. I think you, in Sarah, Minnesota, it took place at uh, Red Lake, didn't it? Um, I, I oh, was it might have been a skirmish, yeah. Uh, also, Mille Lacs, there were Mille Lacs. Yeah. Mille Lacs. Dr. Thumbo, too, had some. Um, I don't want to miss anybody. Does anybody else have any questions? Want to know any reason? Oh, sorry, uh, Debbie, go ahead. I want to know what else, if we can continue to anticipate more adventures from Cork. I, I wait for each one to come out so I can buy it and gobble it up. And um, I just love them. So it's part of my personal culture. <laughs> it's really about Cork. So um, yeah. there'll be a book coming out this year. Yeah, first of all, I have to say, I love you, Debbie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm just putting the, I'm, I'm working on revisions to number 18 in the Cork O'Connor series. It's called yes. Lightning Strike, and it's actually a prequel to the series. Um, so, you know, Iron Lake, in reading Iron Lake, you know that Cork's father was sheriff of Tamarack County when Cork was a, was a boy, and his father was killed in the line of duty. Um, so, Lightning Strike takes Cork at the age of 12, um, somewhere wow. before his father is killed. And what it's allowing me to do is explore the relationship that Cork had with his father, the relationship he had with his mother, the relationship his parents had, all of these important relationships that shaped Cork into the man at the heart of the series now. Um, and I'm having, I've had so much fun with it because uh, um, Sam Wintermoon is still alive. He's an important character in the book. Um, Henry Malou, who's 105 as I'm writing the series now, is like the spry 65 year old guy. He's a whip, young whippersnapper <laughs> in, uh, in Lightning Strike. <laughs> uh, typically the book would have come out this fall, but because of the coronavirus, many publishers are delaying publication of, uh, of books. Mine now is scheduled for release in August of 2021. <clears throat>
That's a long time to wait. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have to go back but, and reread some of the other 20. <laughs> and I swear to you, Debbie, the wait will be worth it. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Debbie, have you read um, This Tender Land? You know, I was. I know I've read Ordinary Grace, but now I'm. I'm thinking tonight that I have to go back and read, check, and see if I've got this tender land. Yeah. Yeah, I would highly. I'd highly recommend it. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Doug, did you have a question? Anybody I have a else? Quick one. Oh. Yes, I have a quick one. Was there? Um, was there a reason that you decided to name Madeline Island uh, Wendigo Island? In is the, there a in, message? Is there a message there? Well, in, in the book Wendigo Island, Madeline Island is not Wendigo Island. Wendigo Island is a very small island uh, just off Red Cliff. Um, and it's a fictitious island. I just created it, but it's a very small island. So you weren't you weren't really using Madeline Island as one of the props. No, I just talk about the Apostle Islands in general in that book, but Wendigo Island. Uh, you should read Wendigo Island because it opens in a really scary way. Uh, um, yeah. but that's <laughs> very <all>. easily. <laughs> <laughs> but Bayfield <laughs> Bayfield figures significantly in the story. Um, the the whole uh, Bay. Bayfield Peninsula does. Don't you make reference to Red Cliff as I well? Uh, but I call it something different. Yeah, I know. I, I reckon. I was like, that's what he's talking about. <laughs> well, you know, I just want to say thank you so much, Mark, for having uh, asked me to be a part of the group tonight. And again, I do hope that at some point in the future, I can meet all of you personally. We hope so too. Yeah, Thank back you. when it's safe to hug again. Yeah. <laughs> Penny, did you have a question? No, I, I was just unmuting so I could say thank you when we all had a chance to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think that. Wait for okay. That probably does it. Uh, and we uh, should thank the Lapointe Center for the Arts for our funding for our Zoom program. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very yes. much. That's Good point, but, Paula. Can I say something? Sure. Can I say, I want to just say, talking about La Pointe Center and so forth, and the first question that, that you asked at the beginning was, how long has this particular group been meeting? It goes back to the 1980s. Oh my the goodness. 1990s. And, and one of the significant things that we had going for us as a group then was Wayne Lindquist who lived on Madeline Island. He was a professor of English at the University of Wisconsin. And- uh, At Eau Claire. Uh, at Eau Claire. And he was just sig so significant in bringing this La Pointe Center Reading Club together. He was really great. So it's been quite a while that we've been meeting. I'm impressed. Well done. <laughs> Thank you, Burke, for that. Uh, for answering that question. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, so very, very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all well. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. A pleasure. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.